what a, what a thing to take on. I mean, I was thinking, um, you know, we all came upstairs through the security system downstairs that's here as a result of 9-11. And, and it's a way of saying that 9-11 sort of is with us um, every day, but we don't really deal with it in the way that you do in this film, deal with the emotions that have been there for so long. So could you talk just about what it meant to you to be dealing with this material? Um, well, uh, oh, is that on? Yes. Yes. The, um, yeah, I mean, I suppose the one of the things that you, I mean, I, I'm saying the obvious, really, but uh, the, uh, I think for our, our families and the kids who um, did go through that kind of stuff at last, I think they do deal with it on a day-by-day -day, day -day basis, even um, uh, 10 years on, and I think it is still a very real um, and profound um, issue for them, um, mostly because it's in the, it's, for them, it's in the papers, and it's on television, and they can never escape it. Side. It's, a, it's omnipresent in media um, constantly. So, um, so for them, it's very present. I think that, but I think probably you know that we're all living in the shadow of it in, in yeah. a variety of different ways and in a variety of different reasons. And how did you go about sort of finding the, the tone? I mean, I guess a lot of that comes from the novel, but there's this. Uh, it's so raw and so emotional. It also there's a, what I felt was almost a magical quality throughout uh, the film. So you you really Strike a balance. Do you know, uh, we only finished this yesterday. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's hard to, so, yeah. so uh, <laughs> I'm really interested to see, um, you know, people's reactions. I'm also interested in my own reaction because, um, inevitably, when you're making, a, particularly when you're finishing a film, you spend so long on, you know, the door bangs and the music and the sound, and you sort of um, lose sight of it. And so it's very strange. And watching it again, I have, I'm not. <laughs> it was just the strange music, yeah. That's how you felt? That's my soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, it's, uh, yeah, so it's, a, it's a very odd experience watching it, um, watching it, because I haven't really watched it. I haven't, well, literally, I haven't watched it for, for all the way through for weeks. So, um, it's, it's, it's quite a shocker, really. I am, I, I'm still in a little bit of a... Of shock is it hard for you to go on the on the emotional ride? I mean, if you you know the, the sound that you we heard in the audience was a lot of sniffling. I mean, there's a lot of it's uh, it really got to people. Well, it got to me. Yeah. I mean, it, and it, and that's what I mean really is that for a period of time you're you're so involved in the technical aspects in the finishing of a film. It's very it's a very unusual experience to suddenly watch it. Normally, you know, it's like just what I've watching it back with everybody. It feels like a director's playback with lots of people, um, which is a good thing. Um, and uh, no, I found, it, I found it very distressing, which I must say. I have to start by asking about this amazing performance at the center of the film. You have such an incredible cast, but um, you know what, what Thomas Horn does who's the, uh, is a performance I'll never forget. I think it's just incredible, like what he, what he does in this film. Um, so how did you find him? How did you work with him? Well, we cast, um, they cast, you know, you go through these normal casting process of, of looking for children, and we cast um, right across America, in different cities, and, and in Europe as well. And we were quite clear, um, Scott, the producer, and I were very clear that if, um, <coughs> if we couldn't find the kid, then we shouldn't go forward. Um, and the Warners were very supportive of that idea as well. But we, we sort of went into sort of pre-pre-production and started casting, and um, it was Scott, actually, who remembered seeing a kid on Kid Jeopardy. <laughs> this boy, Thomas Ward, had won Kid Jeopardy. <laughs> and so Scott said, you should get that kid in. And wow. So we got the kid in. And um, we had, we'd been auditioning kids from all over America and some from Europe. And um, we got all the kids together for a, um, we called it a, this is sort of a boot camp, but it wasn't really, it was like a very long audition um, that lasted a week with all the kids there. And then uh, finally cast Thomas. Um, who was amazing, and um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, I mean, everybody must make their own judgment about it, but I, I think for me, I think it's one of the mo most sort of extraordinary performances by a child I think I've ever seen. Yeah. I think that's pretty, pretty clear. I think it's, yeah, I think he's sort of astonishing, really. How is it to get to those emotional places for him? I mean, well, so if he's on Jeopardy, he can do all the brainy <laughs> stuff, but, um, you know, where the, the... Well, the hard thing about 
children is well, it's not really hard. It's in some senses it's easier, particularly if they haven't done anything before. It's it's because you you know like any, when you when you're trying to direct actors, one of the hardest things to work out with directing anybody is different actors have different methodologies, different ways of approaching how they act. Um, inevitably, you know, different training and different ideas and what you're doing as a director is always trying to sort of second guess what the methodology is so that you can actually have a language to communicate. And the communicational language is the key thing that you're trying to find with, with any actor. Um, so you can be honest and actually work. The advantage of the child actor is, is, that, you, is that, that you're not having to deal with any, you're not trying to second guess a methodology because there isn't one. Um, what you have to do is create a methodology. So what we, and that takes time, but that's what we did. And, and, and it's a very, basically you spend many months trying, training. You train them in, a, in an acting methodology that um, works for, for me um, and the other people working with the child. And it, it's basically, a, it's, a, it's a methodology based on late Stanislavski. And you would go through and he would, he would learn actions or intentions. Um, and he would learn the script with only actions and intentions. Every word and every thought would be broken down into different actions and intentions. And then, um, so that we, we, we could talk about it in terms of those actions and intentions. And then the next process would be trying to physicalize that so we had a physical language that we could um, understand what we were doing physically in a sort of, I mean, it's a sort of, um, it's a sort of, like the technique I use is sort of poor man's love and technique, actually. It's a sort of um, and then, so that once you've got that, then you, you've got a very rich way of communicating and, and a very and a shorthand. The great thing that Thomas had was, a, is, apart from his incredible determination and tenacity of intelligence, is, and this was why we cast him, is that surprisingly he has this extraordinary emotional life. Now, Thomas, there's no loss in Thomas's life. He's a, he's, he has fantastic parents and he's very happy and he's very good at school. And there's, loss is not part of his life yet. But what is part of his life is, is a rich, you know, this extraordinary emotion, which we saw pretty much, I think, um, looking at Tarek, who was uh, my associate and well, co-producer, but he's a guy that worked with me on, on all these films. And we were the first audition, and it was true, wasn't it? We, he and we, very quickly, he had, we saw this emo huge emotional life. And that was what really ticked us off, that he might be able to um, do it. And, I mean, there's certain things that I, you know, I'd love to other people to see, really. Because, for example, that you know, there's a section where he, he sort of the story so far he gives to Max von Sydow in the kitchen. That we call it the monologue. It's you know, he he, he was doing that in one take. That would be one go. He would get through that. Um, he is astonishing. I mean, it's yeah, I would call him genuinely astonishing. I think so. I think we agree. I'll ask you about one thing and then we'll take, open it up to questions from the audience. But the scenes uh, between him and Sandra Bullock are just amazing. That dynamic that goes on throughout the film between the son and the mother, and kind of, uh, you know, the kind of anger, the, the difficulty of their relationship. Uh, it's, it was unusual to see that. Sort of. Well, what was great, you know, it's great about having Tom and Sandy in it because both took on board. Uh, a responsibility of dealing with a child. You know, t Tom Hanks knew that you know the child had this idealized version of who his father was, and Tom literally spent the time with Thomas Horn and formed this extraordinary bond. I mean, Tom Hanks took took on board that responsibility and did it so brilliantly that the charm in their relationship was really what Tom man managed to um, achieve. And I just filmed it. Tom was just astonishing. And then the great thing about Sandy was that she, because the scenes are so difficult mm. between them, she managed to find a relationship with Tom, Thomas, um, where they were in a safe place. So they could be, you know, um, as emotional and difficult and challenging to each other as they are. And, uh, but I was blessed with two extraordinarily generous adult actors who uh, sort of knew what the deal was and then did it with extraordinary grace. Okay, raise your hand if you have a question. Right over here. I wanted to thank you, first of all. I live downtown, and I try not to see these movies. And so it was very cathartic in many ways, some of the images that Thomas was dealing with. Um, that said, the, the exquisite casting, I mean, every performance 
um, is, is it's such an ensemble piece of work. Um, Viola Davis in particular for me. And, and, and Lola, and also Lola in a small I part. There's so no small happy. parts. Isn't that great? And, but there's no small parts. You see, each of the, but what I wanted to ask you is about why is it that we allow ourselves to get caught up in these kinds of stories when it's told from the point of view of a child rather than from an adult? What is it about the fact that the story is told from the point of view of a child that, that, get, that enables us to get so involved? I, I, I don't know is the honest answer to that. What, I, I don't know. I mean... You had Billy, and now you have this. That's, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I think my dad died when I was sort of 13. I think I've always tried to remake that story mm. about dead dads in one way or another. Mm. So this is a, another way of me trying to explore my own relationship with my own father and in, in a way, I suppose you could say. I try not to analyze it like that, but I'm, I'm guessing somebody would. <laughs> <laughs> right there. Um, I am someone who lost his father when he was seven, and your depiction is perfect. Uh, over here. This is a, a very, very good movie. Uh, New York City Flyman. Right. Nice to see you. I see Lee I helped you. Uh, yeah. Did you talk to Lee? Yeah. He's we, a friend of mine. He's a very good uh, guy. Oh, yeah, Lee was great. Did he help with talk to Tom Horn? Well, Did Lee, um, we went to Lee obviously really early on. And I, w I went to Lee, people who don't know Lee, Lee runs um, the Tribute Centre down, uh, down there uh, at, at Grand Sierra and, and, and on the Memorial. And, he, um, and I wanted to talk to Lee because one should. And I wanted to include him and I, didn't, you know, I just wanted to make sure he knew that I was planning this and what his issues might be and how to handle it. And he gave some very good advice. And we talked about this other organisation that is credited called Tuesday's Children, which we spent a lot of time. <coughs> Tuesday Children is a, it's obviously an organization to support the kids and the lost parents. 3,000 kids lost there. Did Tom Horn mingle with these children? Yeah, Tom, uh, Thomas Horn. He had to to get that kind of take. It was, yeah. It was Thomas. excellent then. And uh, Lee was great. You know, you Lee's lying. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. He's fantastic. So he, right. he would take, he took Tom, Thomas Horn um, down to the site before it was open and took him round and about his son. Did Lee take you all around the borough? Because you hit some great spots in the city. Yeah. Oh, great. I mean, what is that, Hamilton Beach? I mean, people wouldn't even know where to find that. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, I know where it is, but yeah, that's right. he must have took you to some great place, you know, Bushwick, or Stuyvesant Avenue. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you know them all. Of course. Well, <laughs> I've been all over the city. You know. But that was good. I really enjoyed this movie. Uh, I have a party Wednesday. I'm going to talk this with Fireman. This is excellent. Most 9-11 movies like this man, you shy away from, because it doesn't, doesn't hit it, but again, it's through the mind of a child, it's perfect, it's just a very good movie, thank you. Oh, uh, well, thanks, thanks very much for coming. Nice. Okay, um, all the way in the back, and then down here, go ahead. Um, I was just curious, I mean, how old is he, about 10 years old now? How old is Thomas Horn? Mm -hmm. No, he's older than that. Um, Lee's 13, he's just, just turned 14. say I really believe he understood it and it's he, yeah he really did and we you know he, he's a studious boy as well so we did we did all the 9-11 stuff and of course all kids know but as you as I'm sure everybody I don't really do know this but it's not only really curriculum I mean my kids go to school in PS3 and, and they, you know my daughter knows all about it obviously because <laughs> she's my daughter but the other kids don't it's amazing, it's amazing to me how little ed education there is about 9-11 for the kids. Hmm. Thomas did know um, a good deal. Um, and Lee, again, helped, you know, put him on the, you know, Lee was fantastic with it. But he did a lot of it. He got, he was very, very good at learning all the, as much detail as I knew, which I know, I knew a hell of a lot. Um, and then, so he went through that process. But honestly, emotionally, um, 
I don't, I mean, I don't know what to say about this. I honestly can tell you, if he was, I mean, the only other person I know who's got that much emotional life that's available to them is Meryl Streep. <laughs> because Meryl can just go, oh, I know all about it, and they just go there. Do you know what I mean? And Thomas is, there's a, he just has that access to it. Um, and he does have, you know, he's a complicated child um, with this extraordinary emotional life. Okay, right down here. I think that what really attracted Max to the role was that he didn't speak. Um, and Max, Max's career is being so much um, leading man. Um, you know, and I think Max, in his later years, was sort of getting um, fed up with being offered judges and um, fathers, you know, grandpas. I mean, he just got fed up with the, the, the role, with the sort of same old role that mm. a lot of older actors tend to get locked into. And then, so he, this was, so he found this so freeing, not just because he didn't speak, but because it, it allowed him a sense of humor. And I think he'd never been asked to be funny in his whole career. And it was just <laughs> a huge release for him. He just found it. And he was, I mean, honestly, he's the most fun person to work with. Um, incredibly detailed. Um, again, fantastic with Thomas Horne. They had a great relationship. Um, and did you actually direct him, or did he just come <laughs> on what to do? <laughs> 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 let's, let's give the guy some credit. No, but I'm saying, Meryl Streep, she knows what to do. I mean, they just come. No, but they do, John. Let's ask Scott Rudin that question. Do they come with you? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, of course. Max, of course, is one of the greatest actors um, in the world. I mean, he's, and, and has been for uh, 60 years. Um, but of course, you know, it's what the fun of it is to, is to, is to work with actors. That's why you do it. It's, um, that's, the, that's the part of the job that I love. And Zoe? And Zoe Caldwell. Zoe is, well, Zoe is actually an old friend of Scott's, and I've known him years because I've been watching him in the theatre for years, you know. Um, so the idea that um, I could ask Zoe Caldwell to play Grandma it was just a huge, I, I was, I, I don't know how, I, it was a huge, um, I was incredibly flattered that she said yes. I was just thrilled that she said yes, um, because I enjoyed her work in the theatre. You know, and so I had sort of like given up, like, oh, well, I'm, no, I probably won't do another, you know, cinema thing. And, and then, oh, no, okay, no, I'd love to, great. Um, so it was great, it was a total joy. Okay, right down here. Yes, hi. Um, gosh, I, the directorial effort, I, I'm just astonished, and uh, I just want to thank you for that. Um, the, I was so touched, really very touched by the scene where uh, Thomas, uh, in a rage, destroys all of his work. And Sandra's restraint at that. Uh, and she comes in and asks the right <coughs> I was, I was really fearful for her life at that time, because the boy had some shrubbing. But, but that relationship, and, and for her to know that the way they work together, I thought was just mm -hmm. wonderful. And the destruction of that work, kind of, that scene set up almost a reveal of her coming and saying, I knew where you were all of that time, and I had my own plan when I was home. I thought that, that part of the film was just magnificent. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. And, um, Thank you, from me, for making a film that portrays men 
at all ages, from young, middle aged grandfather up, husbands, fathers, you know, in such a such a wonderful manner. Um, it seems to me lately I don't see a lot of that in, in film and theater. And I want to thank you for thank you. That's very sweet. I appreciate it. When you say that, I also think of Jeffrey Wright's performance because that, I mean that scene at the end is is uh, it's just a devastating scene, an amazing scene. How great scene. is Jeffrey? Because and um, Jeffrey is. Of, often Jeffrey's cast is tough guys, and to watch Jeffrey be that vulnerable and be that yeah. open is just, it's just magical, I think. It's a wonderful performance. Okay, a few more over here. So she wants to know how you how you were able to make a movie that's so emotional, but not uh, yeah, but not overly so that keeps the kind of control. I mean, I wonder if part of that you mentioned the humor. You know that uh, that must be part of it. Well, great. I'm glad you say that. Thank you for saying that. Um, I, I obviously have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, you just don't want to tell us. <laughs> no, it's because you never. I mean, you know, you just sit there and try to try to follow your own, I mean the hard thing for me, I honestly, is I think the hardest thing for di about directing is getting to a point where you can relax when you're working so that you, you can actually feel what's too much or, or what you need to, to need. And then I do tend, you know, a lot of the time I put in, I mean, and I do, you know, I put in silly jokes really to amuse myself or, or you know, during the book making, and then my editor Claire Simpson quite rightly cuts them out. <laughs> So it's a balance, you know, that Claire worries about as well, um, about how to find, you know, making sure. I mean, I don't know. I don't honestly know. I mean, I do. <laughs> <laughs> decisions for you to make about how, like what to show. We we have such vivid images of 9/11, of and you had to decide what to show of people falling out of the, you know, you, like how much to show and what to show because those those images strike such a chord. Well, you know, the the, the family groups were really useful because they particularly Tuesday's children because the, the kids do you know I mean do we do should we really talk about this? But I suppose we should. Um, a lot of the kids do. Have, you know, do. I don't know whether this is discreet or not, really, but. I think you have to say it. Well, well the kids <laughs> uh, who really, you know, they do talk about jumpers and who jumped or whether their father jumped or didn't jump or their mother did. Or, and it, it's a currency of conversation mm -hmm. amongst, the, amongst the kids. Mm -hmm. A lot of the kids do um, have recurring dreams or nightmares or recurring images, mm -hmm. um, particularly of jumpers. And it was one of the key, you know, and they do do what the kid does on the internet and try to identify and swap the pictures and try to work it out. And actually it was Lee um, who had one of the first things I said Lee, to Lee was, you know, what do you feel about the John person? What do you feel I should do about this in the story? And he said, you've got to do it. He said, you should, you should show it. Just enough. You, you just show it enough, do that's it. all. But don't talk yeah. about it. He said, you, you should talk about it. And, if, and that's what the kids feel. He said, then you should talk about it because it's something that you haven't been talking about. So I took with my line from Lee um, on that, and, and again from the, from the real kid. Um, yeah, maybe that's part of the distress so quick. <laughs> maybe that's part of the answer. Is the, the question before about why it's so powerful to see it through a kid's point of view. Kids really do try to figure it out. I mean, I have two boys. I have a, a nine-year-old and a fourteen-year-old. The younger one, 
is obsessed with skyscrapers and he's like researches them and um, is like fascinated by them and wants to know about ground, ground zero and, and like he's really trying to work it out. I mean, I think adults right. tend to not not do that, but you know, the kids at a certain age, like maybe on, in that age, like 10 to 14, these images were there right when, you know, when they were just becoming conscious. And they've like spent a lot of time trying to work it out. So you have a character who has the time to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, we'll just, just take a few more and then. And, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, great film. My question is this. Um, in the first bedroom scene with uh, Sandra Bullock and the young actor, they were so cold to each other and they weren't affectionate at all. And then by the very, very end of the film, he's got his head in her lap and they're very affectionate and they're open with each other and so I was curious was that your idea or the idea of the actors to not touch in one scene but then by the end be more mother-son so the arc of the relationship between the mother and son I think it was a long discussion with Sandy uh, predominantly uh, about what uh, how much distance the, the mum you know and it was anti instinctive for Sandy you know she, to to be that withdrawn from the child, and so it took a lot of discussion about how, and you know, and to be frank, you know, whether we wanted to portray her being that far away mm. from the child and not connected, and then how we would build that and actually have the reveal at the end that actually she was really trying to connect with the son, and then that connection would happen. So, in a way, it was just, it was a very long discussion with Sandy. Okay, let's take one more from the audience over here. Right, and I, well, I, again, the boy had in the story has such an <coughs> obsessive relationship with his father right. and not with the mother. And, exactly. and then I think part of the story is that you know, the, the, the boy coming to find that he did have a mother after all. And I mean, I think that is essentially what the story is about the family mm -hmm. reforming after this uh, catastrophic loss. My, my question is. Um blessed with Jonathan Sutton Fro because he was um, so generous um, and Jonathan was with us all the way through, um, right the way through with me and Eric Rob who wrote the screenplay and was helping and advising right the way through to um, uh, Wednesday this week. <laughs> <laughs> said, you know, but in the book, um, but in the book, that comment, that phrase never, never came. Not from him, I just, I, I'm just, I mean, I'm thinking more of yourself in, in reading the book and, and deciding. Well, what it's a long, be. it's a long involved process in everything between uh, Eric Roth and, and Scott Reed, the producer, and, my, and myself over a period of time before we um, got to pre-production, and it, it, it's a process of inevitably you have to lose certain strands of the book that you focusing on others. So that's just the... I'm just curious if you had one example that you can think of. <coughs> well, in, uh, the, be one example would be in the book, it's, uh, a, it, I think it's one line, maybe it's two lines that mum says I got a phone call from him as well. Mm. Um, and then I went, oh no, we should see that phone call. of that where it was it was uh, it was clear and then I 
decided what we decided that it was best what the story was about what the child would then do with that answer she would have loved rather than go through that and watch that I think it would be better if we imagine that narrative after the film rather than us actually present it thank you very much thank you so, just, uh, so now that you're, you've seen it with an audience and you're getting this kind of response just do you feel relieved or how do you feel <laughs> I'm exhausted <laughs> <laughs> so is everybody here from this um, I mean, not just in the work, but it's just, I mean, it's just like, I don't know, it's the, it's the, tonight was the first time I've watched the film properly uh, for a while, so it's, it's, it's quite a, it was um, quite a, uh, an experience for me. Yeah. So thank you very much for showing my film. Thanks a lot.